And welcome to Understanding Photography with Kim Ayres, episode 103. Today we have the Wilderness Challenge. So, last week, um, I, after chatting about uh, my um, trips to the desert and showing a few photos, I set the idea of a Wilderness Challenge for people to enter. So we've had about a dozen or so people uh, send in their images. Now, I has to be said, wilderness was open to a fairly wide interpretation. I mean, literally speaking, a wilderness is a kind of uninhabitable part of the world. So you might be in the heart of the desert or um, know, the Arctic tundra or something like that. Uh, however, given the fact that most viewers of this podcast don't really have access to that, we kind of stretch the boundaries a bit. So we've got a few different interpretations of wilderness and today we're going to look through the images and you know see how they've turned out, see see what different people have come up with and hopefully maybe actually inspire each other for some ideas of what we can do with our own landscape photography. Um, if it, we're here live now currently on YouTube, if you're here leave me a comment, let me know you're about and uh, say hi, tell me where you're from and Tell me what the weather's doing as well, and then we'll make a start. So, welcome. Um, here we are, like I say, live on YouTube. I can see we've got quite a few people in already, so let's let's check on a couple of comments. So Meg says hello everyone. Robert and Anne are saying hi from the Mojave Desert in California. Oh gosh, it must be pretty early for you there, because here it's three o'clock in the afternoon. Um... Okay, this isn't looking quite so good. I seem to have frozen on the screen. Now, bear with me one moment while I just see if that's going to make any difference. No, it isn't. Right. Okay, yes. Okay, April's telling me I'm frozen. So, can you still hear my voice? That's the next bit. Um, if you can or you can't, what are my options here? Am I going to have to close and come back in? Okay, still got sound. So what I'm going to attempt then is to unplug the um, the webcam and plug it back in. So first of all, let's just see whether this is going to work. My apologies. It looks like we even have new people in today. Um, and all right, shove that back in. No, now I have no webcam at all. Right, okay. Now this is a bit awkward. So the only thing I can think of doing is stopping the streaming and start, right, picture frozen. Can I do, right, that will change, that changes, that changes. I have no picture. Hmm. This is gonna be really tricky not having a picture if I can't show you pictures. <laughs> I may have to just sort of stop and start again. Um, Bear with me, I don't know if I will, I'm hoping I might just come straight back into this one. If I don't, if we end up with a couple of minutes where you don't see me at all, go to Kim Ayres at, uh, sorry, yeah, youtube.com forward slash Kim Ayres and see what the latest one that comes up as, because I might just have to do that. But okay. Bear in mind, please, just for one moment, I'm going to stop streaming and start streaming again. Uh, right. Okay, so the question is, is, is this going to reconnect me? It looks like it has. Woohoo! <laughs> right, I think I'm back. Yay! Okay. Here we go. 103 episodes in and I can still get tripped up by all the technicals. I, that's, I think that's the first time this has frozen me completely here. So, okay, let's start again. Phew, okay, right. So, comments. <laughs> so, yeah, uh, Robert, saying, Robert and Anne are saying hi from the Mojave Desert in California. Uh, Karen is saying hi all from a sunny but cold Shipley in Yorkshire. Uh, Maggie is saying good afternoon all. Laurie is saying good, uh, good morning here from Oregon. I have to work today, so I can only be here for 30 minutes. And of course, some of those have already disappeared. I'll tell you what, Laurie, I'll make sure we look at your picture fairly early on. Uh, Roy is also saying greetings from a sunny and cold West Yorkshire. Annette is here and says hello from a cloudy Brussels. Uh, 
May Britt Larson says, good afternoon from Denmark and thank you very much for the invite. So glad you could make it along. Uh, Rosemary says, good morning from Washington State. April says, hi everyone from a cloudy Long Island, New York. Yellow Leaf Production, oh that's Helga from uh, Norway says, good afternoon. John says, hi all, checking in from Columbus, Ohio. Sophie says, good day from Tel Aviv. Um, okay now April saying I'm frozen that's going back a bit so hopefully we pass that bit uh, yeah Robert's saying it's 7 a.m. in California so glad you're up that early I'm very rarely up that early <laughs> I'm only up at 7 a.m. if it happens to be in California um, Jackie says hello uh, from South Africa okay then um, oh Diane's here and says hi all then we've got a few comments where people are sort of saying about the fact that it's uh, yeah yeah, you can hear me, can't see me, and okay, Rosemary's gone, yay, you're back. Uh, so it's Annette, excellent, right, okay. <sighs> okay, good. Oh, and Anne said hello, everyone, excellent. Right, so let's try and make a proper start now. So here we are. So to talk then again about the idea of the Wilderness Challenge. So I can see we've got a couple of new people in, which is really great. Um, just to give you a little sort of rough idea, generally speak, uh, there are sort of slightly different versions of the, these podcasts. Uh, with some of them, I talk about uh, previous photo shoots I've done. Some of them I talk about a particular aspect of photography or a particular aspect of um, uh, composition or lighting or techniques. Uh, some of them have a critique section in. So people send me images and I look at them and we give a bit of critique and feedback. And sometimes I do challenges. And this week was about a challenge. So this challenge was known as the Wilderness Challenge. So like I said, but about a dozen people or so sent in their images. So we're going to look through their images. Feel free to comment. Um, and we'll just kind of get a sense of... you could, what's, I think what's really interesting about the challenges is it gives you a chance to see how other people are interpreting. Most of the people here are very commonly use... Uh, a lot of these kind of photo um, competition sites like Photo Crowd or Guru Shots or um, Viewbug and the like. And we know what it's like. A competition title comes up and we go, well, yeah, OK, well, well, I wonder how I can interpret that. And then we put our thing up and we look and everybody else seems to have really weird, amazing interpretations or just strange interpretations. We're not sure what we're doing. So I think this is kind of always a bit fun with these. So what I decided to do was, like I say, the wilderness challenge. Now, what I'm going to do then is I'm going to start off. We will look at uh, this one by Rosemary. And uh, right now, one sec, I need to do not that one, not that one, that one. No, that one. That's what I wanted. Yes. So here we go. Share the screen. This one's from Rosemary. And I'm starting with Rosemary because she's got quite a detailed explanation for this one, but also has a question thrown in, which I thought in some ways gets the heart of the nub of one of the particular aspects of photography, which I feel is really important. So um, Rosemary said this was a tricky week for photographing our nearest wilderness because our weather was wildly fickle. Well, and we've all been having that one. Uh, my wife and I were over in Northumbria, the northeast of England. Um, and it was supposed to be a really beautiful, sunny couple of days. And uh, we actually got snowed on, sleeted on, heavy, heavy rain, cold wind. Nothing like what the weather said it was going to do. But <laughs> anyway, to be able to appreciate the beauty of the mosses on the trees, which is the most prominent car characteristic of our woodland around our house, you need a really good backlight. And I think you're absolutely right there. Um, a really good backlight really captures the mosses. And if if we sort of zoom in here... You can sort of see the way the mosses are kind of coming down and the way the light, when you've got it kind of, the light is behind, it sort of captures everything, gives this kind of golden halo around and it's a really rich thing. Um, however, Rosemary goes on to say, um, our, the light was pretty unpredictable and we only got doses of about 45 seconds at a go, which was pretty frustrating. Now, being in a location where it had an interesting element of story and composition and that incredible backlit moss was quite a feat of good luck and quick captures. While this shot does not hit any one of those three things spectacularly, it does at least to attempt to attempt to include each of them. There are other shots that do justice to the single elements, but lack the other two. So what she's talking about then is story, composition and light. So. Rosemary goes on with this question, which says, in a challenge, is it better to aim for all three, story, composition and light, or to single one of those criteria out and really nail it? And I think the important bit here, Rosemary, 
is to understand, I think really, is to understand what I mean by story. One of the things I talk about quite a lot in photography is that the story is the most important part of an image. And once you understand the story, that in turn uh, helps you to know what you do next with, all, with, the, with each of your decisions. And you use light and you use composition and you use camera techniques and settings and everything else in order to enhance the story you're trying to tell. But what I mean by story is the story you are trying to tell. It doesn't necessarily have to be the story of the place, unless that is what you are trying to tell. The story, when I talk about the story of a photo, the narrative of a photo, it can be as simple as, I love the light. Look at the way something has caught your eye. And this is another thing that I often talk about that I like to talk about, which is there's a reason you pulled the camera up. There's a point where you go, you've taken a photo. Why did you take that photo? What was the really important part of you taking the photo? Was it something about the way the light was? Was it something about the way a line was? Was it something about the way you had a particular clash or complementary colours? Was it something about an action or a movement? Was it the way something was sitting in relation to something else? That's the story. The story is, what is it that caught your eye? What is it that makes you go, ooh, that's really interesting. I want to photograph that. And particularly, what do I want other people to interpret or to see or to feel when they look at this photo? And it might just be something as simple as, I want somebody else to go, ooh, at the way that line sits there. Or I want them to go, ah, with that sort of sense where you can almost smell the dampness of something or the dryness or the, the fragrance, you know, uh, could you kind of, how could you feel it? How could you introduce other senses? So when we go back to a picture like this, when I say, what is the story? The story doesn't actually necessarily have to be about the whole woodland. The story could be about something about the fern and the deeper greens, or it could be about the way the fern differs in texture from the moss. Or it could be the way the light is hitting the edge of the corner of the mossy tree trunk. Or it could be, and in this case, what it feels like is that the story is the denseness. The dense, there's the mossy green denseness of woodland. And so I think that's really the point that I wanted to try and get across to you, uh, Rosemary, is that Really, once you understand the story, what in the story being, what's the bit you really want to get across, then it, it, it's fine. So if you're talking about the fact that, you know, there's something about the light and could you nail the light? If you can get a really good photo, a really good photo is just going to make somebody else go, ooh, that's what you're after. OK, so I hope that makes sense, Rosemary. Um, and of course, there are anybody else who happens to be watching as well. Um, Right. OK, so Rosemary's just saying thank you for helping um, for explaining story. This helps. Excellent. Um, OK. Oh, we've also got a. Uh, now you will have to bear with me while I attempt to pronounce your name. And please forgive me if I get it wrong. Uh, Sub Subalak <laughs> Subalakshmi. Subalakshmi, I think, is the way you pronounce it. Yeah. I Please tell me if I've got it wrong, um, but welcome. Really glad you could make it along. Uh, so Super Lakshmi says, hello, Kim. Uh, feeling wonderful to be here. Thank you. Uh, Rosemary says, thank you for explaining the story. April says, I feel like hiking there. Um, that is my story. I like to get out of this picture. The greens and the density is nice. OK, excellent. Right. So let's move on then. So uh, the next picture. So what I will do now um, is I'm going to go to Laurie because Laurie said she's uh, she's got to rush off fairly soon. So let's just take a quick look at Laurie's picture here. Now, Laurie says. With regard to her picture, where are we? Um, this is a Joshua tree in the National. Oh, sorry. Joshua Tree National Park at twilight. And yeah, that's got this kind of wilderness feel to it, doesn't it? It's rather lovely, I think. And the beautiful kind of uh, the pinks and the blues in the background, I think, you know, you've got that real twilight feel, fantastic shape of the tree. And I really like the way that you've got the tree so that the as the branches come out, they are above the horizon line. They are the bit that are then framed against the sky. 
a, a slightly different angle and that could have been you could have ended up with that that mountain ridge running through the middle of them which i think would have kind of made it a little bit too busy but i really like the fact that they kind of poke slightly above quite possibly with something like this you could have even squatted down a little bit lower and just allowed that tree to kind of push a little bit higher another option with something like this i think is this is a scent you're trying to get that sense of the tree and the landscape and i think what would be really quite interesting is if you made this wider um in a way you can yeah you can either i tell you what, i mean I'm, although i'm not really supposed to be doing much in critique in the way of this it's more about supposed to be showing off i think there was a point where you were kind of you mentioned you were kind of hoping for a little bit of feedback on this so i'll just briefly drop this into um yeah, sorry just get rid of that bit i just want to talk briefly about the idea of a couple, a couple of different kind of crops and i think if you sort of crop it more like this you get more of a sense of a landscape and again if we just briefly do a content aware even um where you would say you had this kind of stretched out something even a bit more like that and we'll do the content aware which will fill in the gaps now you see something like that i think gives you a much more sense of the, the the landscape and the width and the and in turn the wilderness of that and we'll get a little bit more of that when we come on to ben's photo shortly but in the meantime there's that option however Another option for you, Laurie, I think, given the height and stuff here, is to actually, you could have done this in a kind of portrait. Um, you know, where what you're doing is you're emphasizing the sky and the, and the ground. And again, if you really wanted, um, take that higher, maybe pull that in a little bit, something like that. We could, you know, depending on how much, what the, or how interesting the sky was, you know, that gives you a different kind of feel. Again, that's sort of given that that then brings much more of the idea of the sky contributing to the wilderness effect. You know, that that sense of the big, the open, the wide, the the lack of um, human activity within it. So. Just a couple of ideas there for you, Laurie, about how you might um, play around with with a photo such as that uh, certainly at the point of um composition uh you know you know as as you're looking at it through the camera so what else have we got okay a couple of um couple more comments here Oh, Rosemary saying to April, um, thank you, April. You're welcome to come and hike in our woods any, any time. Uh, and Annette really loved the black backlit effect uh, in Rosemary's pictures. And uh, Super Lakshmi says, absolutely right. Thanks again. You can call me Super. OK, Super, I will try and remember that. <laughs> it means all good. Fantastic. What a lovely name. Um, April says, oh yeah, April um, loves Joshua trees. Uh, Super says, love the light uh, in the sky. Meg says, fantastic photo. Uh, Rosemary says, that's a lovely photo, Laurie. I do like the crop to enhance the, the scale of the scene. Um, uh, Super also think, likes that. Laurie says, loves the photo stretched out. And the next says, interesting ideas there. Excellent. Um, and Laurie says, thank you so much, Kim. Appreciate your thoughts and ideas. That's good. Um, oh, <laughs> Robert says, Anne has been trying to get that shot this weekend. And of course, while you're in the Mojave Desert. Yeah, try. So there you go. Hopefully then that gives you a couple of ideas there, Robert and Anne. Um, right. OK, let's move on then. So next up, we've got April. And uh, April sent in this photo and says, this is the Cypress Forest in South Carolina. It was taken with my old battery operated camera. I was in a boat while I took it. I thought I, I, it gave a flavor of what looks like a, uh, what it looks like in a cypress forest on land and and water. I must admit this is really I mean this is a, a completely different kind of woodland and uh, to the kind that I'm used to as well. Quite kind of swampland almost. Um, I love I love the, the the light coming through the. Now here's an interesting one which is always worth remembering for anybody who's trying to photograph woodland. One of the problems that you often have with woodland is that if the light is behind you, the photographer, the light tends to hit the trees and then it just disappears and becomes very dark very quickly. And so trying to get that sense of layers 
through the trees is really difficult. However, what works particularly well here without it for April is the fact that it is lighter at the back of the picture. And as such, we look through, we, we've got the shaded foreground and then we've got the light in the background and it gives us a much, much greater sense of depth going into the picture. What's also really nice, of course, as well, is we've got some fantastic reflections uh, down in the water here. We can see how the, 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 the river or the water, you know, kind of curves around the edge here. One of these, is that, is that like a kind of little stone area or can't quite make that bit out anyway. But there's, there's, some, there's some lovely bits to sort of kind of go in. There's posts there. There's, looks like there's sort of stuff to go in and have a good old sort of hunt around or, or walk around. Um, so yeah, again, another one I think actually, to be honest, April, which I think would benefit from being wider. You know, I do tend to feel that when you've got this kind of thing, go, go cinematic with it. You know, I won't, I won't kind of do the crop again, but a bit like I did for uh, Laurie's picture. Um, imagine if you just sort of cropped it, taking this back and taking it further wider, maybe actually further out to the right, perhaps got more of the trees and more of the water in there. I think that could have really enhanced. But, you know, having said that, I think this is really lovely and you get that lovely sense of sense. You've got a great sense of light and a great sense of depth because of the fact that you've got the light behind a dark patch. So thanks for actually, I should say at this point, smug points. Yeah, you know, um, Rosemary, Laurie, April, you know, thanks to everybody who's sending in. Have some smug points. You know, these these are fun photos. These are good photos and really quite inspiring. <laughs> um, OK, where else are we? Um, and uh, OK, oh, Levi is here, says good morning from Minnesota. Glad you could make it along. Uh, Super saying hi, April. Um, April says, yes, cement. Oh, cement. Oh, right. The little piles that were there. Yeah, Rosemary says you can really feel the humidity there. Oh, April says, please show me. Ah, OK. <laughs> let's let's just try this then. Just to, just to kind of show you what I mean then is that basically we will do the content aware again, just to give you a sense of, I think if you were to pull out to something like that, and let's hit enter, see what it does. Now, obviously it's not quite lining up the fact that you've got the reflected water particularly well, but what you can get, what I'm hoping you get a sense of with this April is that, that you know, I think that wider sense gives, just gives you that bigger expanse of that sense of being absolutely immersed in the forest, in the woodland. Um, like I say, the, the auto content over here hasn't done necessarily the best with the water, but it does give you a sort of slight sense of what it would be like. So hopefully that makes sense. Right. OK. Um, so where am I? Uh, oh, what's Rosemary saying? Something I like about April's original is the balance of the two darker trees on either side framing the scene. You can have it framing the scene, but also sometimes you could have used, you know. Yeah, it, it's like all these things. There are lots of different options. And unless you're actually there, because I don't know what really was to the right of the trees. Um, I'm not necessarily going to know what's going to work, but this is always worth. This is why we take take loads of photos. You know, you, you digital is great for this. Um, but again, it's trying to get a sense of what's the story? What are you trying to get a sense of? And if you wanted to get a sense of that sort of depth and the scale and sometimes getting that sort of slightly wider screen helps. Right. OK, so let's move on then to Ben. Actually, I know, I'll tell you what, just before we move on to Ben, let's do the question of the week. I almost forgot about that. Um, for uh, anybody who has access to Facebook, I've got a Facebook group also called Understanding Photography with Kim Ayres. Just type that into Facebook somewhere and it will come up. You can then join it. And generally speaking, most weeks um, I tend to put in a question of the week just for, for the fun of it. And this week's question was about chocolate. Um, oddly, not a, not a great deal to do with photography, unless you happen to be photographing chocolate, I suppose. But it says, do you prefer white chocolate, milk chocolate or dark chocolate? Or does it have to be over 70% before we even consider it worth eating? Or are you not a fan of it at all? And just for those who did actually sit and enter the, you know, put in their opinions, I will say there was a big sort of uh, dark chocolate 
got more votes for it with Chrissy, Diane, Karen, Sophie, Benetito and myself as being these are the ones we go for. Uh, Milk Chocolate, Suba and April said that they were absolutely irresistible, couldn't stay, up, stay away from it. Megan on the other hand was white chocolate all the way through, even though some did in fact debate the fact as whether white chocolate even counts as chocolate, uh, Megan thinks it's it's absolutely there and any as long as it's called chocolate they don't care. Uh, VG and Mac both kind of came in for that one. Um, and Ben talked about, well, he really liked dark chocolate or white chocolate, but felt that milk is a compromise that satisfies neither. <laughs> so make of that what you will. What's your favourite chocolate? OK, let's go back up, throw ourselves back into photography then. And um, while Ben, let's talk about Ben's photo now, because Ben actually did, in fact, use um, did in fact also use that uh, idea of content fill aware that Photoshop has to in fact stretch this out a little bit. So to talk a little bit about, so uh, to tell you what Ben says. Ben says, the wilderness challenge was both very dear to my heart, but also very difficult. I love the desolate and the bleak and the misty, but I haven't figured out how to get a decent picture of it. So this is a different kind of picture taken in the Cairngorms in Scotland. It was all about the crop. I deliberately tucked the abandoned cottage into the corner as if, as if it was an afterthought in the vast and rather featureless landscape. If you walked into that picture, it would actually be two hard days before you reach a road. The left hand 20% of the image is courtesy of the content fill aware. I did it out of curiosity, but I was amazed at how much it improved the composition and energy. Um, giving a light leading line that swoops down towards the ruined cottage. I haven't tried to disguise the artifacts from the content aware field. This is an exercise in composition rather than a finished product. So essentially what happens is if we were to sort of that pretty much that, OK, let's come uh, probably something like about that is probably the original photo of Ben's. And then this bit here most of this bit here on the end has been added in by doing the content aware, which is exactly what we just did with both April's photo and with Laurie's photo. And part, part of the giveaway here is if you look down here, you can see that we've got a re repetitions happening with the markings on the landscape here and then a sort of certain amount of repetition on the line coming up here. So if this was a photo that you were wanting to actually print out or enter into a competition, you'd really want to go in and sort those bits out. But what Ben's saying is that, you know, even with those bits kind of cropped off, you know, even with his original photo like this, um, that's what he had. He's cropped it in, given it a fairly wide crop, but then he stretched it out just to really overemphasize, you know, that, that notion of the wilderness. And it is, I think, again, it's coming back to why I think it works particularly well, following on from those other photos that we've looked at, that, that sense of wilderness, that sense of open country, that sense of vastness is emphasised by a much wider crop. And um, and then, of course, if you go in for one of these with Sky, you, you can, it's two different ways. You can either kind of play for maximum ground or you can play for more Sky to give that sort of sense of openness and kind of sort of desolation, really. So... Interesting one there. I think Ben smug points for for trying that trying out the the content to wear, but you do need to to get in. It doesn't take much, but uh, to kind of touch up and you know figure it, sort out the the repetition points in that. And I think it's probably well worth doing. So thanks for sending that one in, Ben. Okay, few different. Uh, comments here. What have we got? Uh, Karen said, oh, uh, Meg and I tried white chocolate cake while walking. Lovely. <laughs> Elga says, lovely wild landscape and well composed. Yeah, Meg's talking also. that She loves every different kind of chocolate. Diane says, uh, Meg, I keep white chocolate in the car as it doesn't melt like the other two. Is that right? I haven't realised that. And it's hidden from everyone else. <laughs> <laughs> Secret stashes of chocolate. Um, April says, nice photo. Must remember about the photo aware content and wide or widescreen options. Suva says, it's beautiful, especially the hut and the small body of water on the right hand side. Rosemary says, that creates such a strong feeling of isolation. Well done. Ah, OK, here's an interesting one. Annette says, wondering if you think the editing of this type is considered OK in online competitions, for example, photo crowd, or would people consider it a cheat? 
April says, um, I love your narrative. Okay, Annette, that's a really, really interesting question. And I think it comes down to that. You see, there's different ways you can interpret. There's always different ways you can interpret photography. But essentially, it's like the idea of are you trying to. How much do you consider editing cheating? It's one of these. There's an interesting debate. I've occasionally had it in the past on, on these podcasts, but of course we're on episode 103. So not everybody's heard these things. And I think. When you're talking, there's for some people, there's the notion of in camera photography that essentially everything you do with the camera is at the point you go click. That's photography and what you what the camera creates. And then anything you do after that is kind of cheating. Flip side of that is that the other argument is that editing is a critical, crucial part of photography, that the point you go click is the starting point for how you're then going to edit it. And the analogy for that is like, it, would you consider the first draft of a poem to be the best version or the only authentic version? Or would you consider it that when somebody scribbles down their first draft of a poem, the idea is that they're then going to sit and edit it to make it the best version that they can. Now, I, for, for me, I tend to fall into the, the second group with that. But that's also because what you're talking about here, I think it's the difference between whether you're talking about kind of documentary photograph photography or narrative photography. Now, documentary photography, if you're taking a photo and saying these five people happen to be standing in this spot at this time doing this action and we're reporting this as the news and the truth. Then I think at that point you have a duty to make sure that if you are editing, maybe you're just making it a little bit clearer. All you're doing is enhancing it by maybe bringing a little bit of detail out of the shadows. Um, taking away any, you know, cropping in to, out of distractions. But the the truthfulness of the photo is in the truthfulness of the story is in the kind of accuracy of the representation. However, another form of photography here is the idea of what you are trying to do is convey a mood, a feeling, a story, a narrative. And at that point, if you think about the idea of fiction, fictional writing, or poetry or something like that. At that point, sometimes you can tell a deeper truth through narrative than you can th through um, facts alone. It's not about facts, it's about mood, it's about feel. And at that point, darkening the sky a bit, widening the scene, the way you crop it, the way you edit it. Maybe you decide, you know, there was a little telegraph pole right in the middle which kind of ruined the efforts you wanted that you decide to remove it. I think as long as you feel clear in, the, in your sense of the idea that what you are trying to do is convey a mood, then the photography is, is a tool to help you convey that mood. The photography is a tool for communicating. And that tool is there. So your photography, how we take photos, our photography is about how we convey a mood, a feeling some kind of essence of idea towards somebody else. How, can somebody else pick up on what we're trying to do? In the same way that writing a poem or writing a short story, making a film, playing a piece of creative, uh, composing a piece of music. You know, music's another one where you're trying to convey a mood or a feeling. And photography then I feel is a very much a tool for doing that. Uh, the problem comes is if you are trying to use, say this photography represents truth, in which case, I think at that point, yes, adding on bits that weren't there, taking out bits that were there, um, then becomes a kind of a falsehood. But if it's about conveying mood, I don't think there tends to be such a problem. But this is also, but it's also very much a personal down to you, down to how you feel about it. Everybody's got a slightly different angle on this. And what do you feel comfortable with? You know, if you don't feel comfortable with doing that, if you feel that actually to remove anything that was there or to add in something that wasn't feels false and uncomfortable to you, then don't do it. There is no right or wrong with this. There is different interpretations and what you feel works for you. So hopefully that kind of opens up a bit of debate, you know, or gives you some ideas to think about. Um, OK, April that says, Ben, I love your narrative. All right, Helga says editing is doing things to a photo that was or was not there in the original is the oldest 
thing is um, and it was barely younger than photography itself. Yeah, so I just, yeah, essentially what Hell was saying is that editing has been around for as long as photography has. Um, when photography was done on glass plates, people would then go in and paint on the glass plates. When photography moved into negatives, people would paint the negatives. And then also in the editing process of transferring the negative to the paper, people have done all sorts of things, airbrushing, painting, um, changing all sorts of things. So editing has always been around. And if you think about before photography, there was painting. Painting was essentially Photoshop in its raw sense. Um, everything was made up, you know, and people and artists have always um, painted bits in and removed bits and sort of to make a composition which works. What was more important, the most important thing is when somebody looks at that picture, does it work? Do they like it? Does it do it for them? Does it communicate what the artist intended? And that was always the case with painting. Photography, why should it necessarily be any different? So, okay. Uh, oh, and that says that's helpful and useful guidance. Thank you. Excellent. Good to know that. Right. Okay. Let's move on then to Jackie. So, um, oh, this one. Yeah, this really has not just wilderness. This has such a feeling of desolation. This this is almost like, you know, feels more post-apocalyptic to me. Uh, very wild. So Jackie says, this is my entry into the wilderness challenge. It was taken a few years ago when South Africa was going through a drought. The area in the photograph was previously covered by dam water. But now, as you can see, it was transferred into a barren wilderness. I'm happy to say that the dam called the water Scloff, the water Skloof. Yeah, there you go. I'm, I've never seen the word before, so... Who knows whether I'm saying it right. Trying my best. The water scoop is now at maximum capacity. So the little wilderness has disappeared under the water, hopefully for many years to come. So that's quite amazing. So there were rich. So originally then there was obviously this sort of woodland or forest here that was then flooded out because the, the place was dammed off. Then there was a drought. The flood water dropped down. This is the point that this was the, the photo was then taken. Um, and now you couldn't get there because it's all covered with water again. So really moody that. And also what I also like here is the fact that we have this low cloud mist in the background and then the, the top of the mountains just kind of dipping out the top, out the top there. And again, all I would really say with this um, is once again, I kind of want to see a bit more of it. And I think stretched out a little bit. I, I suppose it's one of these things and the regular viewers will have heard me say this quite a lot. Very often when we come to photography, there's a feeling of I think you very often you either need to be closer in or you need to be further out. And too often what we do is we where we take the photo is kind of in between compromise. And when we look at a photo like this, we've got this wonderful tree trunk here and you could have, if you wanted, kind of closed in and moved in on the tree trunk like this. And this then becomes very much about all the texture of the amazing tree trunk. And then the, the wood, woods in the background here become like a kind of supporting actor. We don't have to worry about the mountains. It's all about the kind of the in close and the wood. Alternatively, if it's about the wider landscape and the space, again, there's just this kind of feeling where I just want to widen it a little bit. So um, again, a lot of you know, better to take the photo than to do it in Photoshop. But again, if you were to do just something like this, even, I think, and again, it's not fully really worked it out. Um, we wouldn't have those mountains down there. We wouldn't have those treetops down there. But if we were to bring in a few bits of tree over here or something, I think just getting a kind of bigger, wider sense of it would be a kind of a little bit more interesting. Um, anyway, lovely photo, smug points there for certain Jackie. Um, a really interesting kind of backstory to it as well. Um, Rosemary says, fascinating Jackie, a haunting scene. April says, wow, interesting. And Jackie says, that would make an interesting crop. I think that's where I was zooming in. Absolutely. So, if the, yeah, if that foreground wooden uh, trunk was interesting and then you allow the trees to sort of support the trunk as, as opposed to the trunk being one element within the larger landscape, further in or further out. Brilliant. OK, next up, then we are going to go to Karen and.
Karen sent in this one, which says the wilderness challenge, not very wild. Well, I suppose if we're trying to talk about the idea of uninhabited by man, the fact that we've got stone walls built, uh, dry stain dikes, as they're known north of the border here in Scotland, um, or dry stone walls, um, that, of course, a very man-made thing. But having said that, we don't see any, we, we don't have tractors, we don't have people, we don't have motorbikes or cars or any kind of real urban build up here. So there's that feeling of being out. And I think, again, there's a sort of certain notion of wilderness, uh, which if we're allowing broader interpretations, if you happen to live in an in urban environment, if you happen to live in the city or the large towns, then stepping into a countryside domain like this feels, feels like the wilderness. Um, so Karen goes on to say, um, Yes, a landscape pretty unspoilt, um, taken in Grassington, as in, it's, as in Yorkshire again, um, uh, oh, just a few weeks ago as well, by the look of it, by the look of it. What's really nice about this is the, the way that you, you the, the walls, you, you get, you lead into the picture, you know, because we've got the walls coming, the wall down this side, and we've got the old broken wall coming down this side, it leads us into the picture, and then we know that we could, you know you're high enough above the wall to know that it opens out into the field beyond got this nice tree at the end of it um sun up in the sky yeah it's it's, it's it, it is i think with this you get that kind of i can almost kind of smell smell the yorkshire um is that the dales there uh but anyway you know the, the the grass that's sort of slight you know that damp is a little bit of warmth in the sun but it is still winter so there's probably a bit of a cool breeze in there too uh, very kind of yeah moody atmospheric northern england um landscape there so yeah nice one there karen um thanks for sending that one in uh, smug points yes why not <laughs> oh april says that's a very pretty picture okay um so just a uh, roughly about halfway through the the pictures here and uh just a, a wee reminder here that if you happen to find these um these podcasts useful interesting informative entertaining um or a learning experience and you would like to support them then one of the ways you can do that is buymeacoffee.com forward slash kim airs always there always a help right okay so let's move on then and we're going to talk uh mac so mac sent in a uh, photo of um let's see let's move that there move this here and max says early morning below the killy village in cyprus uh not much wildlife as the locals have eaten most of it <laughs> uh but still a peaceful place i call my second home so what's really lovely about this is the fact that we've got the mist in the valley here and they're just the, the tips of the trees and buildings just sort of poking a, a Above, um, out of the mist. I think it's, it's get that early morning, um, that sort of crisp smell of just before the beef, and of course, if this is inside, before the heat of the day kind of kicks in. They're very moody, very atmospheric there. Once again, I kind of feel go wider screen on something like this a little bit, Mac. Uh, but other than that, you know, it's uh, nicely caught, and you've got the nice kind of layers of the sky going up there and you do really get that kind of early morning misty feel to it so yeah brilliant thanks for sending that one in mac oops not that one right um okay so let's move on then to uh robert now robert sent in this one it says i took this photo last september on vacation near utah this landscape caught my eye and we and we got out to take some shots after a few shots this horse wandered into the frame so of course i took another ten thousand photos <laughs> smiley face um actually only got about 30 but this is the one one of the only ones where the horse was looking at me to be perfectly honest he was not that into me i tried not to overcook the editing and hopefully this meets the challenge so wonderful to get out into utah i i is utah is the, that kind of wonderful rugged mountainous landscape is one of those things i think well I've, I've not been to that part of america um only ever seen in the movies it does look quite amazing um and what i think in a way that the horses are the horses are really interesting addition to this i think if, if you take the horse out it then you it doesn't really work as well i mean again let me just 
show you. If we take a look at that photo and just, for the sake of it, remove the horse. And then we've got a landscape, and Robert has gone fairly wide here, which is quite good. Get a good sense of the mountain range in the foreground. But it's fairly dull, it's fairly boring. I don't think, there doesn't really feel like there's a context. So when we go back to here and actually have the horse back in, you can see just how much of a difference that actually makes to the photo. So yeah, smug points there for you, Robert. I think the horse, wait, you know, deciding to use one of the horse photos rather than um, one without, I think is probably definitely worth pretty much worked in your favour. The only other thing I would have said with something like this, and of course it's not something you presumably are there just at this time of day, this has the, all the feelings of would work so much better near a sunrise or near a sunset, I think. The, the mountains in the background, um, if, we, if we look at the, the shadows here, we can see that the sun's fairly high and there's not a lot of shadow on the mountain range. Whereas if you were to sort of come in there and, the, and you had longer shadows, you would have got much more of the texture of the mountains, possibly some of those shadows moving across the foreground, the landscape as well, you know, the, uh, yeah, the, the, or the midground under the mountains. And that would have given us a better sense of depth, I think. But the fact that it's sort of green in the foreground, yellow in the midground, and then we've got the mountains in the background does help to give us some sense of depth. And certainly the horse um, helps there, add in some extra bits and pieces. Um, to the feel of the photo. So thanks for sending that one in, uh, Robert. Um, okay, so where are we? Um, okay. I seem to have... Where... So I've suddenly lost where I am with the comments. Um, Roy says, lovely aerial perspective. Um, oh, presumably we'll be talking about Max one here. Uh, and then April goes on to say, I want to go to Utah, Bryce Park one day, nice shot. Um, and she goes on to say it's much better with the horse. Rosemary agrees that the horse really makes the shot. And uh, John, uh, John from Ohio says, love the shot from Utah. The horse adds a lot. Um, right, okay, cool. So let's move on then to Roy. Um, Roy's now is Roy in Yorkshire has taken us to Brimham Rocks. I've actually been to this place. It's really quite amazing rock formations. Um, Roy says this is my entry for the Wilderness Challenge. Uh, this shows Brimham Rocks found in the Nidderdale area of outstanding natural beauty in North Yorkshire. These rocks were made from millstone grit and were formed about 400 million years ago. And uh, yeah, there's, the, 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 it, there's a whole kind of area park here where you, there's these incredible shaped rocks and you, you know, you, you just want to go and clamber all over them and that often and quite often. But the, the trickiest bit here actually is trying to take a photo like this where you don't have a whole pile of people clambering all over them. Um, <laughs> this looks like it was probably taken during the summer, maybe probably is presumably last year. There are green leaves on the trees, so even more amazing that you don't actually have people clambering all over them. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it's quite a wild place. Although there is almost a sense here of kind of needing something to give us a little bit of sort of scale and perspective. And again, potentially the idea of having it a bit wider. There are some really amazing rock formations there. And I think to get a bigger, better sense of uh, some of these shapes could have been really quite interesting. Alternatively, a bit like Jackie's one, you zoom in closer and you make more of the shapes of some of these rocks. Um, maybe it was something like this. Or you use the rocks to sort of frame the background. Um, yeah, maybe actually I quite like something like that, I think. But you know, ignore the fact that I'm sort of sitting up here in the top right corner. But coming in that little bit closer and get that sort of shape of this, you know, allow that rock to dominate a bit more. You've got the tree, you've got these other shapes around here. Is maybe, for my, for my money, a sort of slightly more interesting crop. Or if you're trying to pull out and get more of it, again, I think you want to maybe go a little bit more widescreen, get more of the rocks over to the left or the right. Um, but yeah, really interesting place and one of those places I have actually been to. So thanks very much for sending that one in, Roy. 
Um, uh, oh, right, you've got Charlotte. My, says my, my niece Charlotte says, uh, obviously logged into Mike's account. That's, that's her man's account. Uh, much love, Uncle Kim. Much love to you, niece Charlotte. I'm glad you could make it. Um, April says um, that the Brim and Rocks one has a desert feel to it in the photo, but it is not. That's quite cool. Um, Roy says I had to kill them. Oh, that's pretty... <laughs> as, as other tourists, is it? Uh, yeah, throw their bodies over the edge so that they don't get in the way of the picture. Right. Um, okay, so next up then we are going to... Oh, that's the point. Now, for those of you who are watching last week, uh, Roy was talking about, he was asking to get some ideas about a loop. And a loop being this little thing that you stick over the back of um, your screen so you can get a better sense of what was going on. So he has since um, bought one. So this just to give you a sense of what it is. So you see this thing here. You can, this, the, the, the bit down on the bottom right, that goes over the back of your uh, camera screen. And then you've got a lens up here. This bit here is a lens. So you can actually then look at your screen much better. And because it's covering the thing, is, it's, you know that problem. You take a photo, you try and look in the back of your camera, and the light around you, you can't really see what's going on. This thing fits over the top, so now you can see really excuse me, clearly without any distractions. So Roy, so for those of you who are wanting to know a little bit more follow up, Roy says he went along to a Royal Photography Society landscape workshop in January led by a professional landscape photographer called Mark Banks. I recently asked his advice about buying a loop and he recommended this hood loop. So it's a loop, L-O-U-P-E, um, and uh, recommended this, which I've now bought. It's not the cheapest, available at 89 pounds, that's UK sterling, 89. Uh, but is the best according to Mark. I've given it a test drive today and I wonder how I ever managed without it. Not only does it allow me to examine every part of the screen in detail without putting on my reading specs, it also slows me down. It's like using a viewfinder uh, but with a much, much bigger and better image. I really like it. So, highly recommended here from, uh, from Roy and for anybody who's ever struggled with you take the photo, but you can't really see what's going on in the back. You're not sure whether it's really working. Obviously, it appears this is one of the ways to go. So very much, uh, thanks a lot for um, for recommending that and telling us uh, how that, that panned out for you. Um, so yeah, anybody else who's thinking about that, now you know you've got a place to start. So thanks very much for that, Roy. Um, oh, Maggie says, like the Hoodman graphic. That's, <laughs> that's just, yeah, somebody was obviously having a bit of fun kind of creating that. Um, so, yes. Uh, right, okay, let's move on then. So, Sophie. So, um, next up we have Sophie. And Sophie was, was for my world in this challenge, I'm entering a photo of the Torre del Paine Park Peaks in National Park Chile's Patagonia region. Wow, those things are really high, I think, aren't they? Um, I took this picture whilst hiking there. It was very windy and cloudy and poor light. Um, yeah, the, the, again, not a place I've been to, but from what I've seen from the kind of, uh, you know, National Geographic or um, uh, nature programs on TV, it's an incredibly dramatic uh, region. Now you can see the the the, pike, uh, the the peaks flying up here, and actually I've just noticed here. There's is this a couple of people walking? There's a little splash of red there. It looks like uh, somebody you know, maybe a red coat. Two people walking ahead, um, which as we kind of move out, starts to give a, given the fact that we know that those mountains are even further away, and we're just kind of almost in the foothills here, um, starts to give a sense of scale of it. One of the things that we have talked about slightly before, almost impossible to do under these circumstances, which is actually when you're really wanting to try and get a sense of height, it helps if you're less if you're standing underneath it, but more if you're standing above or on a higher ridge to begin with, and when it drops down and then goes back up. So I don't know what it's like the other side, but essentially if you were standing up on this bit here, say for example over on the right, Sophie, so that it dropped down a bit and then the mountains went up. I think it would help you to give a much greater sense of the sheer scale of them. We know these are big um, 
you can see snow on the top but I think if you're really trying to convey it in that first glance from the photo that's maybe another way of going about it but yeah in terms of wilderness uh, you know, fairly inhospitable areas then the Patagonia mountains has got to certainly count for something like that so thanks very much for sending that one in Sophie really interesting um, and uh okay april says gorgeous mountains meg says an incredible photo maggie says the mountain shapes are wonderful and charlotte says beautiful photo too okay uh next up then suba um so suba for her wilderness challenge sent in this one and says uh, this is my photograph for the wilderness challenge it was clicked at tacky oh, T-A-K-I in West Bengal, India, by my mobile phone. The building was a ruin of an old Jaminda Kuti, Jaminda Kuti, where Durga Puja was taking place. Um, somehow, I think it would have been better if I could have taken this snap from a little closer. OK, so this is what's really interesting here, then, is you've got ruins of a place. And if you're talking wilderness, it, there's that sense of the overgrowth. We can see here where... You know, the, the plants are all starting to grow up over the side of it, tumbling over the building. So that kind of we're moving to sort of the lost city style of I mean, I love the I mean, you've got all these sort of root systems coming, you know, where the trees have sort of grown up and then kind of the forest, the jungle reclaiming the buildings. So at one point, obviously, a very busy, um, you know, man made place with a lot going on and then for whatever reasons is it is deserted lost and then uh nature reclaims which is a lovely idea so you'll think about would it have been better if you'd taken the the, the photo closer up or i think it's another one of these the, the kind of theme of today i think which is you 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 then you're presented with choices do you, you and i think try both um if you come back out further, how much more of the growth are you going to get? If you've got a smaller building that's isolated within that sense of you've got all the, the, the jungle around it, I think that can be really powerful. Um, or is is the kind of the really interesting bit getting close in? You know, if you kind of come in close like this, then what you have is... You know, maybe you're concentrating on the root systems and the way the root systems are starting to cover over. But we can still very much see the architecture. We know that this is man made. We've got the, the beautiful stonework. But then I really love that idea of the nature reclaiming. So, again, it's part of what's the story. What is it? What is it about when you when you were standing there and you pulled out your camera? The question you need to ask yourself is, what is it that's really grabbing me about this? Is it the idea that I can see that, that I love the whole building and that sense of emptiness of the whole building? Or is it the sense or is it what's grabbing you is the sense of nature reclaiming and really you love the, the roots that are going into it or the emptiness? Um, and then once you kind of understand that, if you've asked yourself that question, that then helps you with the next decisions you decide to make. You know, well, maybe I need to get in closer. Maybe I need to stand further back. Maybe I need to wait until the sun comes out from behind the cloud to cast shadows, which are going to give me a different sense of depth. I mean, this looks like a very kind of like um, of a fairly dull light where the light has gone behind the cloud or something. So, But I can imagine, depending on where the sun was, whether it was higher or lower, and depending on the kind of shadows that got cast with this, that could dramatically change. Even standing in the same place, the photo could quite look quite dramatically different if there were shafts of light coming down and casting shadows inside the building, coming through where you know the roof has obviously disappeared. So lots of different options there, but thank you very much for sending in uh, your, your first photo to the Understanding Photography with Kim Ayers Challenges, Suba. Uh, uh, smug points to you for doing so, so excellent. Um, oh, Charlotte says Tomb Raider style. It looks like something out of the game. <laughs> yeah, I absolutely, I can kind of go along with that, Charlotte. I get what you mean. Um, now, bear with me just one sec i realize um now 
because Charlotte did in fact stick a photo in as well and I'm suddenly realizing I didn't actually put it drag it across ah, here we go so what I'm going to do is I'm just going to save this um, into there and Charlotte basically said um, I know it's not wilderness but I do love the mist on the water so I will just show you Charlotte's photo just now um, here we go. So <laughs> this looks, I mean, is, is this, was this taken in Torquay or Paint in Charlotte? Um, you'll need to let me know, which is actually quite an urban built up area. Um, but yeah, I can see what you mean. It kind of almost, I, I think because you can't really see the buildings, you can see the lights, of course, but you can't see the buildings, but you've got the water. There's a little bit kind of mist on it. There's, yeah, there's kind of a almost wildernessy feel to it. So I can see where you were coming from with, with that, Charlotte. So. Um, and, I, and I appreciate the fact of you sent, sending in the image. Not sure quite why it didn't end up in my folder. Apologies for that, but we managed to, to get that one sorted now. So smug points. There you go, Charlotte. So thanks very much for, for sending that one in. Right. OK. Um, sort of minimize that, minimize that. Come back to here and flick back over to here. Um, where are we? Oh, uh, Super says the nature reclaim. Yes, that's exactly what I was thinking. That was um, which made me uh, fascinating. You wanted to take the photograph. OK, so that's that's excellent. Once you understand that, then you start thinking, well, if that's the bit that I want to get across, how many different or how, what different ways can I go about it to try and get that get that idea across? Um, OK, so Charlotte says it's not the wilderness, but I do love the mist. Yeah, paint, paint in Victoria Park. Right. <laughs> excellent. Oh, and Super says thanks a lot, Kim, for all the suggestions. Excellent. Glad that was useful. Right. OK, let's move on then to um, VG. And um, now VG sent in this one and says uh, this was taken during a visit to a nearby mangrove forest near Pondicherry or Puducherry. Um, it was a hot day, but once we entered the forest, the light from the streaking sun streaks, the light from the sun streaks fell onto the water. It was surreal, blinding at times and uh, ethereal too. The spikes were sharp and like daggers and we had to wade through them. The eyelets uh, widened into the, by the broad, deep lagoons. It also possesses inlets that are narrow enough to allow a boat to pass through. Here you can see our boatman wading through the water and the mangrove spikes. So wow, yeah, I mean, here's a very different kind of landscape. Again, not something we tend to have locally here in Scotland either. Um, so you really do get that sense of, you know, now, unlike some idea of wilderness or wildness, uh, the, uh, the idea of the area which feels kind of uninhabited by man, which is about the big wide open space, this has the density, the kind of the mangrove forest. I mean, nobody's, you know, if you, if you are living in here, you're not getting, you know, you're not driving around by car or even easily walking by foot um, or even easily getting about by boat by the look of it. Um, so, yeah, I quite like the fact that, you know, we're seeing the light play coming down. You know, we can see the little light and shadow on the back of the guy's shirt here. And then we're getting the, uh, the patterns, the reflections in the water and all this density of um, density of branches but we've also got the green in the leaves so there's a lot going on here um, potential to play around with the editing I think to sort of bring out a little bit more in the shadows maybe darken down some of the highlights um, but I think yeah, really interesting obviously taking this while you're on the boat as well so yeah, a, a fun, uh, interesting shot there. I think it, it does. It does take us into another world um, there, VG. So thank you very much for sending that one in, and uh, hope you didn't get too scratched by the by any of the spikes and stuff either. <laughs> oh, we've got uh, Binod Singer says hi. So, hi Binod, uh, glad you could make it along. I'm afraid you've missed the first hour of it, but. Um, these, just as a reminder to anybody else, the, all these uh, are recorded. If you go to youtube.com forward slash Kim Ayres, uh, you can find all 102 previous episodes. And of course, if you missed the beginning of this one, you can go and watch that. This will be... Um, uh, and oh, 
Vinod says anyone who is on photo crowd also actually I think you'll find most of the people here are on photo crowd um, tends to be probably the, the richest recruiting ground I think really is uh, people from photo crowd um, but there's also other sites from um, guru shots and um, view bug there's a few different competition sites and quite a few people who come and watch these uh, podcasts enjoy those kind of competition sites too uh okay and that says what's the duration of the podcast this is my first time thanks well <laughs> i do i try to keep i try to keep them to an hour ish they usually stretch over to about an hour and 10 minutes sometimes they go to about an hour and a quarter or even an hour and 20 occasionally they've gone even longer so um don't worry annette we will be finishing off soon uh, in fact there's just one photo one more photo i want to show you now which is from rosie and then i'll tell you what's happening next week so um Okay, right. Yeah, April's saying an average of about an hour and 15 minutes. Um, you're lucky I've kind of cut these down. They did used to kind of stretch to about a couple of hours. but <laughs> So last one we're going to talk about before I tell you about next week's Smug Awards and the second anniversary of uh, Understanding Photography with Kimet. So stick around just a little bit longer and we'll talk about the, the final image I'm going to show you, which comes from Rosie. This is one of Scotland and this I really like because it kind of embodies an awful lot of what we've been talking about today. So Rosie says for the Wilderness Challenge my husband and I <clears throat> recently completed the North Coast 500. So this is a 500 mile route around the north coast of Scotland um, and well, north and west and what have you. There's a whole kind of it's a really amazing kind of drive to do. The scenery was absolutely stunning. Coast, mountain ranges, moorland, lochs and various geographical places of interest. It does have to be say that it does have to be said that the UK in particular, Scotland, well, the UK in general, Scotland in particular, for its size, for such a relatively small kind of square mileage, has like one of the most varied kind of landscapes in the world within one space. I mean, you might have, you know, I mean, you know, Patagonia or Himalayas or deserts where essentially you have one kind of landscape that dominates thousands of square miles. In the UK, within the hundreds or thousands of square miles or whatever, you have all these different kind of landscapes. In Scotland in particular, you've got amazing varieties of landscape within a relatively short, short space. Um, so Rosie goes on. Uh, this is a panorama, panorama of the flow country, a vast expanse of blanket bog sheltered straths, broad mountain valley, moorland and mountains which cover most of Caithness and Sutherland. It is one of Scotland's most important natural resources and this is 10 photos stitched together. So the problem of trying to sometimes get a panorama, get, get a real sense of that thing into one photo is you're just not wide angle enough or you can't get enough. So what Rosie has done here is she's taken 10 photos dun, 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 and then stitch them all together in Photoshop or whichever editing program that you've got. And this way you really get that sense of wild expanse. Interestingly here though, I think maybe if there had been a horse like Robert's or a little cottage like, uh, a ruined cottage like Ben's, it might, I think that little slight touch of a human or a derelict or a non-human animal or something like that would have actually enhanced this even more. But having said that, Rosie, I think this is a lovely photo and I really do feel it gives that sense of wilderness, of expanse, of the fact that you feel like if you were standing there, there's nobody else around and that you could be there for days, weeks or months and not see anybody around. Or even if you went forward in time or back in time, several centuries or a millennia, if you went back in time 5,000 years, it wouldn't look any different. Um, so that really is what he kind of like in wilderness feels. So with this one kind of summing up, I thought it was a good one to end with. So thank you very much for sending that one in. Um, right, okay, so... Uh, what have we got here? Um, all right, Tennessee says, just wondering if my husband has dinner ready. Um, really glad you could make it. Yeah, for future reference, Annette, generally speaking, consider the idea of about an hour, hour and a quarter or so. Um, uh, April says, nice shot. Does Scotland have any famous botanical gardens? Oh, yeah, well, it's definitely in Edinburgh, there's botanical gardens. I think in Glasgow, there's botanical gardens. Interesting, in southwest Scotland, there's Logan. 
uh, garden, botanical gardens, um, which because it's kind of getting the the Gulf Stream has all sorts of quite tropical plants growing in it, which you wouldn't normally expect for somewhere as far north as Scotland. Um, uh, oh, and in fact, Maggie's come in and said, yes, April, all over Scotland with a huge variety of plants, especially on the West Coast, which is affected by the Gulf Stream. Tropical plants, too. There you go. <laughs> Obviously thinking and saying at the same time. Meg says, stunning photo. Um, ben Odds says, uh, the, the picture's awesome. April says, interesting. Thanks for the info. OK, so... Thank you everybody who sent in these pictures. I hope that you really enjoyed taking a look at these photos and getting a real sense of how different people have approached this idea of the wilderness challenge. So next week, and uh, next week then is the anniversary edition, episode 104, two years, two years ago, I started up these podcasts with the idea that I would run it for 12 weeks or 12, 12, three months, um, and see how it went. And here we are two years later. So as a special anniversary edition, I thought, what could I do? And I've always talked about, you know, throwing out smug points. So I thought what I'm going to do is I'm going to do smug awards. This is the, this is the award season. You know, we've had the BAFTAs, we've had the Oscars and all the controversy over Will Smith. Um, we've had, you know, so this is the Golden Globes, uh, the various different awards ceremonies going on. So let's have the smug awards. So this week, what I'm going to be doing is I'm going to be going back through and thinking about who over the course of the last year or two um, have contributed to this podcast. Um, and I'm going to hand out some smug awards. Will you be uh, entitled to a smug award? Do you think somebody else should get a particular smug award? Do you think there's a particular kind of smug award that I should definitely consider? To be honest, I haven't totally nailed this one down yet. <laughs> I'm at the point whereby it sounds like a great idea, it sounded like a great idea when I first announced that I would do this about four weeks ago, and yet I haven't actually had time to pin it down. So sometime between now and next Sunday, we're gonna have the smug awards. So. If you've got some thoughts on this, if you've got what you think is really a really cool idea, Kim, make sure you include this as a smug award or somebody you feel is really deserving of a particular kind of award, email me, kim at kimairs.co.uk. Uh, so just straightforwardly, kim at kimairs.co.uk. You can send me your thoughts, suggestions, um, ideas, and what have you for the smug awards. And then next week, 3 p.m. UK time, tune in for the second anniversary edition and the Smug Awards, and I will be handing out Smug Awards. Following that, week uh, 105, we'll be back to a kind of normal uh, podcast, and I will be doing a critique section in that. So if you have a particular photo that you would really want, to, you really would like to get feedback on, either email it to me, kim at kimairs.co.uk, or put it into the Understanding Photography with Kim Ayers Facebook group. Tell me what your sticking point is and what kind of feedback you're hoping to get and we'll, we'll hopefully be able to deal with that in the critique section. So that's us pretty much. Um, little reminder, if you found this interesting, you would like um, entertaining, useful, you would like to support these uh, podcasts, then buymeacoffee.com forward slash Kim Ayers is one of the ways you can do it. I see we have a final few uh, comments here. And um, Robert says, uh, agreed, Scotland is the most photogenic place I've ever seen. Maggie says, um, oh, and you don't look a day older. <laughs> it says from the two years, uh, two years ago when I started, I think I do look considerably older in the last two years. But if you want, go back and find episode one. Take a look at me. I think you actually, I think I look younger back then. Two years, I've aged a lot in this last two years. Um uh, Helga says, ah, yeah, yeah okay, says to Robert, try North and West Norway. Yeah, I, I, I've never been to Norway, but again, seeing that I would love to get to Norway. We're going to have to, we're gonna, at some point, we will have to have a trip to Norway and get, come and take some of the incredible landscapes up there. Um, April says, have a great week, everyone. Robert says, will do uh, to, uh, to Helga. Jackie says, thanks for this afternoon's podcast. Um, uh, Helga says, thanks everyone to have a lovely week. Binod says, may I send my picture clicked by me? So Binod, if you're wanting to get with that, go and join the, if you're in Facebook, go and join the Understanding Photography with Kim Ayers Facebook group. And, um, and then if you want to submit an image for critique, put it in uh, for, the, for two weeks time. Um, if you're wanting to respond to a challenge, then keep watching, keep coming back. 
every few weeks or so I set another challenge in which case you can submit. Too late for the wilderness challenge now but there will be more challenges to come absolutely. Um, more photos that come, every, I, the more people that take part the better. Um, okay uh, Diane says thank you, Annette says uh, thank you, found this good, interesting, excellent and Helga says contact me if you do. Absolutely I will. So that's us. Um, thank you once again to absolutely everybody who has taken part and uh, those who've submitted the photos and all of you who've tuned in and left comments. Make sure you tune in next week for the Smug Awards. Take care. Have a really enjoyable week. Cheerio.